Around 900 BCE, during the dawn of the Early Horizon period in Peru, a new captivating ideology began to spread throughout the northern Peruvian coast and highlands. In a world of previously diverse communities with small spheres of local influence, this would leave a lasting impact on the future of Andean civilization. And all of this was driven from a small site deep in the heart of the Andes, Chavín de Huantar. Now, Chavín de Huantar was not the seat of a great state or empire, yet so great was its influence that for the first half of the 20th century, Chavín de Huantar was believed to be the primal mother culture of Andean civilization. This was the conclusion of Peruvian archaeologist Julio Teo, who had discovered and excavated Chavín de Huantar and actually coined the name Chavín. Now, if you've watched my Norte Chico episode or have done your own reading, you know that this conclusion was premature. We know now that there are other cities and civilizations much older than Chavín de Huantar in Peru, and that the cradle of Andean civilization lies on the Peruvian coast, way back in the pre-ceramic period. But if Chavín de Huantar was just another site, I wouldn't be dedicating an entire episode to it and the cultural movement that it spawned. Before we focus on Chavín de Huantar, let's do a quick summary of the developments on the coast after the pre-ceramic period. When we last left off in South America, we were at the end of the pre-ceramic period when the Norte Chico began its decline and new cities on the coast began to emerge, along with the first pottery in the Andes. This period is referred to as the Initial Period, and it lasted from about 1800 to 900 BCE. I'd like to return to the Initial Period in a later episode and explore some of these sites in more detail. Many of them are very fascinating and noteworthy, but for now we're going to make a beeline for Chavín culture. What you need to know is that the social and cultural complexity increased dramatically during the Initial Period. The U-shaped architecture from the pre-ceramic stuck around on the central coast, just as the sunken plazas stuck around on the north coast. During this period, populations began to move inland from the coast as irrigation technology improved. The highlands saw new developments as well. Sites rose in complexity here too, and we have our earliest evidence of gold metallurgy in South America. Now this is very basic metalworking, but it represents an important development in Andean culture, and we're going to come back to this later. So now that I've set the stage, let's go to Chavín de Huantar and see what was going on there at the end of the initial period. Chavín de Huantar is located at the intersection of the Mosna and Huachesca rivers in the highlands, at an elevation of over 3,000 meters. The area is well suited to rain agriculture and camelid herding, but it's not particularly exceptional from the perspective of food production. Where the location is exceptional, however, is in regards to trade. Chavín de Huantar is in the middle of two major routes connecting the highlands to the Amazon and the coast. Thus, it was in a key position to profit from travel between these areas. It helped the initial settlement begin to blossom into an important religious and commercial center. Let's zoom into the site and take a closer look. Religion was vital to Chavín's success, and so it shouldn't be a surprise that the dominant architecture here is religious. Chavín de Huantar's main feature is its temple. The temple was built in multiple phases, and so we're going to look at its early stages and then its peak, which is useful because they can be aligned with different stages in the site's history. Let's start with the original design. Well, look at that. We have a U-shaped layout like we've seen on the central coast. To be fair, this isn't the first highland use of it, but it's definitely worth noting the influence at work here. In the center of the U is another coastal tradition, this time from the north, the Sunken Court. The court is surrounded by finely cut stone decorated by intricate friezes of processing jaguars and mythical figures, or perhaps even warriors. The temple was built out of stone masonry. Poking out of the outer walls are several elaborately carved menacing faces that are called tenon heads. These are actually the ends of long blocks that anchor the heads into the wall. Interestingly, these are on the back of the temple, and they would have been the first thing that you saw coming into the city. Nothing says, welcome to Chavín de Huantar, like snarling, fanged faces, I guess. Now, the old temple is much more than just a fancy building and plaza. It's full of passageways and rooms, like a labyrinth. The technical term for these is galleries. Constructing these would have been a daunting task, and although similar galleries do exist at a few other early sites, they're not this sophisticated. The galleries also have hundreds of air ducts and drainage canals to ventilate the space and drain off any water that gets inside. A few years ago, archaeologists were able to explore some of these smaller tunnels with a camera rover and discovered bodies buried within the structure. 
These are likely from sacrifices when the temple was first constructed, since they don't appear to be elite burials. The galleries were full of offerings and ritual objects when they were discovered. Many of these offerings were made of non-local material, which indicates that distant people and goods were making their way to Chavin de Huantar for religious reasons. The galleries could have also served as storage space or housing for priests, but no one is sure. But the main attraction lies at the end of the central shaft, El Lenson. This is believed to be the principal supreme deity at the old temple. The long vertical positioning in the center of the temple represents an axis mundi, forming a link between the earthly and the divine. This idol was likely only visible to priests of the temple, and access to him would have been very restricted. This isn't like a cult idol that we're used to in the Western tradition. Those could be taken out and publicly venerated on special days, but El Lanzon? No, he's fixed in there real good, and he doesn't come out. The old temple is impressive in its own right, but the people of Chavin de Huantar did not sit idly after the old temple was erected. As the city's prestige grew, they added on to the temple throughout subsequent centuries, until it grew into this configuration. The southern side of the temple was transformed into a truncated pyramid. The top was capped with a two-meter-high platform that could only be accessed through the inside. This actually represents a radical shift. The platform is clearly designed for public ritual performance. Previously, rituals would have likely been confined to the galleries or to the lower plaza. Here, it could be elevated for everyone to see. The new temple also had a new sunken plaza constructed. Although not a circular plaza, this one's a rectangle. Leading into the temple from the plaza is the black and white portal, named for the color of the stones used to construct it. The new temple, like the old, has several galleries inside. There's also a new depiction of the supreme deity on a large block of granite. This masterfully executed piece is called the Raimundi Stone. Like El Lanzon, it's depicted in an anthropomorphic style, but this time, it's holding a staff in each hand. You'll remember that at Corral, we saw a similarly depicted deity, but in that instance, the dating was controversial. Here, there's no such controversy, and we can safely date him to this period. Now, these developments did not force a retirement of the old temple. That original section continued to be used for religious ceremonies as well. Unfortunately, we don't know much about the religious cult of Chavin, other than what we can glean from their art and architecture. Chavin art is very distinct. The first word that came to my mind when I first encountered it was busy. But in fact, Chavin art does have a rhyme and reason. Chavin art is marked by simple lines and curves representing identifiable animal or human images. Oftentimes, larger elements are made from many smaller elements assembled together. Bilateral symmetry is also a notable feature in many Chavin works. Another interesting feature of Chavin art is that it's anatropic, which means that you can rotate the work 90 or even 180 degrees and still have upright images. Check this out. This style is so distinct in fact that it makes it very easy to track the influence of Chavin culture. Let's look at some examples. First, let's start off with the big man, El Lanzon. Now I'm going to be referring to the supreme deity as a he, but note that it is possible that it could be a feminine deity as well. Most scholars do consider it to be masculine, though. In the El Lenzon sculpture, the supreme deity is depicted as an anthropomorphic figure with a snarling, fanged mouth, clawed hands, and snakes for hair. In case you didn't catch all the feline characteristics, his headdress is made up of rows of fanged jaguar heads. El Lenzon doesn't mess around. He projects a fierce and powerful image with those jaguar qualities, and yet, his pose appears to be striking a balance, as if he's ensuring a cosmic harmony. Now, the supreme deity gets represented in other works as well. In this example, recovered from the new temple, he's got the same characteristics as before, fangs, claws, snakes, etc. But an interesting difference is that he's holding two shells, a conch shell in one hand and a spondylus shell in the other. Remember from our Norte Chico episode that spondylus shells were prized items, but had to be imported all the way from the Ecuadorian coast. In ancient Andean rituals, these different shells represented opposing masculine and feminine forces, so this also seems to represent a balancing of opposites. Another important piece of art is the Teo obelisk, named after Julio Teo, 
the first man to excavate Chavin de Huantar. The obelisk was found at the site and stands over two meters tall. It's carved with a bas-relief sculpture of what appears to be an important myth. Each side is dominated by a large caiman. The caimans have different crops and plants emerging from their bodies, and this may point to a crop or agricultural origin story. Such myths are common among South American indigenous groups, and it may well be the case here, too. Now, caimans and jaguars are not the only supernatural animals portrayed in Chavin art. Lesser deities appear depicted as harpy eagles and snakes, although what they actually represent is debated. Now, in discussing all this, you may have noticed something unusual. All these animals we've mentioned, jaguars, caimans, harpy eagles, and snakes, are not native to the highlands but instead to the Amazon. So what are they doing here? This is a question that archaeologists have been asking since Chavin de Huantar was first excavated. It's believed that the leaders of Chavin de Huantar had close contact with the Amazon. It's likely that the exotic landscape and ecosystem of the Amazonian forest was seen as a source of spiritual power and wisdom that could be brought back to the highlands and channeled. It's also possible that Chavin de Huantar was settled by migrants from the Amazon who continued to honor their ancestral traditions and cosmology. Now, it should be remembered that Chavin iconography is not just limited to Amazonian flora and fauna, but also shows coastal and highland counterparts as well. The big takeaway from all this is that the Chavin cult, for that matter, much of Chavin culture, incorporated many different elements from many different areas, Thus, the Chavin cult could be both exotic and familiar to different Andean peoples. Like many other expansive cults, it likely encouraged universalism and openness in its practice. Now, such spiritual wisdom would have been guarded and transmitted to the ordinary people by an intermediary. In this case, those would have been shamans. We've talked about shamans on this channel before, but in case you're new or forget things quickly, allow me to explain. Shamans interact with the spiritual world by taking hallucinogens to enter an altered state of consciousness. In this altered state, a shaman could transform into an animal spirit and enter the supernatural world and influence the real world. A shaman could enter such a state and try to bring rains or restore the health of the sick. How do we know shamanism was practiced here? Let's go back to the temple and look at some of those images. Remember those tenon heads? They actually depict people in a state of shamanic transformation. You can see many of them have human and animal characteristics to varying degrees. This is very reminiscent of the were jaguars we saw back in our Olmec episode. Now you may have noticed that some of them have mucus pouring out of their noses. There's actually a reason for that. That's the body's natural reaction to snuffing the local hallucinogen of choice, the San Pedro cactus. This grows in the Andes and contains the chemical mescaline. We also see this represented in several of the friezes around the plaza of the old temple, so it's very certain that this had a special ritual significance. Ancient Andean peoples would snuff the ground-up cactus to take the mescaline and entered an altered state of mind. This gave the priests of Chavin de Huantar a direct link to the supernatural world. Now, the Chavin phenomenon was not just limited to the immediate locality, it washed over the northern Peruvian coast and highlands. But what fueled this? Could an exotic local cult truly have had such a transformative effect on the entire area? The first scholars who studied this proposed that priests and missionaries fueled its spread, but that's a very western way of looking at it. There's actually a much more interesting theory, which is that Chavin de Huantar was the site of an oracle. If this is the case, people from all over the Andes, the coast, and the Amazonian hinterland would have traveled to Chavin de Huantar to make petitions, seek prophecies, and attain enlightenment. Priests, shamans, and cult officials would have acted as intermediaries between the supreme deity and the public. One important thing that makes this theory so compelling is that we know of later oracle sites in the Andes, most famously the Pachacamac Oracle. This oracle was still chugging along in the Inca Empire when the Spanish arrived in the 16th century, and we actually have Spanish accounts that describe its setup and function. What makes the oracle so interesting is that other cities could petition the oracle to establish a similar, lesser oracle in their city, like a store or bank branch. If the request was granted, the city would have a temple constructed and then administered by the appropriate priests. These branches were viewed as wives, siblings, and children of Pachacamac. If these practices were alive in more ancient times, 
It could well be the case that Chavin de Wantar and its religious cult functioned in a similar way. It would also explain the great dispersion of the Chavin cult. At the end of the day, it's just a theory, but one that I really like. So outside of all that, what was life at Chavin de Wantar like, and what impact did the cult have on it? In the beginning, Chavin de Wantar was not a large settlement. When the old temple was first constructed, there were less than 500 people living at the site, a far cry from the burgeoning centers on the coast. They would have made a living farming potatoes, quinoa, maize, and herding llamas and alpacas. However, Chavin de Wantar's location allowed it to slowly amass wealth as it profited from surplus agricultural goods and from the pilgrimage traffic. In time, Chavin de Wantar began to acquire more and more wealth. Once wealth really began to accumulate, a strong leadership class would have emerged. This is evidenced by the continual expansion and rebuilding of the old temple. To do this, they must have been able to amass huge labor and material resources. It's very probable that neighboring communities were mustered to help erect these huge structures. We see this in the archaeological record by the presence of Chavin religious sculptures in these communities at this time. The exact nature of this elite is not well understood, although there likely may have been a strong theocratic element to it. This could have been a religious or social elite or some combination. No elite burials have been found at Chavin de Wantar, nor have any depictions of historical leaders, so we can only speculate about how the authority was practiced. By the early horizon period, the population of Chavin de Wantar may have risen as high as two to 3,000 people, which would have made it one of the largest in Peru at that time. It was so prosperous, in fact, that food began to be imported into Chavin de Huantar. This was possible because trade was flourishing. In fact, we can see this from the number of exotic goods found at the site, particularly from the offerings in the temple galleries. Also, remember what I said earlier about the location. Chavin de Huantar was perfectly positioned to take advantage of Andean trade routes. And boy, did they ever. Goods such as obsidian, marine shells, cinnabar, and exotic ceramics were brought in. Actually, the obsidian trade at Chavin de Huantar was so successful that it became the most common tool material there, even though its source was hundreds of kilometers away, and local chur could have easily been substituted. Many of these materials were elaborately crafted into finished products. A good example is this stromulus shell with a beautifully carved scene of a priest trumpeting. Although this particular example comes from the Lambayeque Valley, other similar shells have been found at the site. These shells would have come from all over the Peruvian coast and even as far away as Ecuador. Now the people of Chavin de Huantar were not just getting these goods as gifts and offerings. They exchanged their own goods as well. Chavin pottery and religious art also appear in far-off areas as well, which speaks to the success of the Chavin ideology. Decorated conch shells, elaborately carved mortar and pestles, textiles, building decorations, and even gold objects have been found in faraway remote sites. Graves from contemporary sites contain many elaborate Chavin-style objects. These sites span all the way from the Lambayeque Valley in the north to the Ayacucho regions in the southern highlands to the base of the eastern Andes. This is a huge sphere of influence, and much larger than anything we've seen yet in South America. When we look around this area, we see this most plainly manifest in religious art. What's fascinating is that these works were not adopted from Chavin wholesale, but appear to have incorporated local tastes. An awesome example of this comes from the coastal site of Carwa. Textiles recovered from tombs contain images of the supreme deity from Chavin de Huantar. This figure is clearly composed in the same style as the deity back at Chavin de Huantar, and we have the same familiar feline elements and the two staffs. But there are new elements as well. Specifically, this deity has feminine features. In some depictions, she even has cotton emerging from her headdress and staffs, which is very unusual. Recall what I said earlier about the Pachacamac Oracle and how the branch sites were viewed as parents or siblings of the original Oracle. If that model is correct, perhaps the Carwa citizens viewed her as a sister or daughter of the supreme deity at Chavin de Huantar. This is really fascinating because it shows how flexible the Chavin cult was and how it could be incorporated into local beliefs. It could be revolutionary and reinforce long-held values. This trade and exchange also had other important effects as well. It didn't just spread an ideology and religion, 
it also spread technology. Textile production saw new changes that spread all over the Andes, including textile painting, dyeing, combining cotton and camelid hair, and warp wrapping. Metallurgy also saw new innovations as well. In the initial period, metallurgy was very simple, usually just consisting of gold being pounded into easily shaped foil. During Chavin's zenith, three-dimensional forms were being forged not just from gold, but different gold alloys. Methods of soldering and temperature regulation are evident as well. Gold objects with Chavin motifs are not uncommon, and this represented a huge leap forward in metallurgical development. Another sign of the success of all this exchange is the abundance of Chavin-inspired pottery. Pottery is almost always made locally. Why import pottery when you can locally source it on the cheap? So it shouldn't be surprising when locally made Chavin-style pottery starts popping up at other locations, both in the highlands and the coast. These are identifiable by their S and circular decorations as well as the animal imagery we've seen earlier. These changes are much more likely to have been driven by personal choice of the potter rather than by any authority, so they reflect the broad appeal of Chavin ideology. What made all this possible was two things. The first was the Chavin cult itself. It fostered common spiritual beliefs that distant people could relate to. It also made Chavin de Wantar a prime pilgrimage destination, and in turn, a location of important exchange. The second was the spread of the llama. Llamas had already been domesticated for centuries, but they had mainly been limited to the highlands. During this time, they began to appear outside the highlands, and so it shouldn't be a surprise that at this time, the first simple roads began to appear in the Andes. Llamas helped fuel trade and, in turn, the export of Chavin culture. This all tied Chavin's sphere of influence together and created the perfect environment with which goods and ideas could be shared and transmitted. Later Andean civilizations owed a great debt to Chavin for this. That's an impressive legacy, and you might expect Chavin de Huantar to have endured for far longer than it actually did. But Chavin de Huantar only survived as a major religious site for a few centuries. There are a few varying chronologies, but definitely by 300 BCE, it had ceased functioning as it once had. People still lived there, but the old rites had passed away. Perhaps people still visited the oracle, but certainly not in droves. Archaeology shows that later people built their houses on top of the plaza, which is a strong indication that it had stopped being used. The city didn't die, but the vibrant rituals and ceremonies seemed to have just faded away, until it was just another town in the mountains practicing another local cult. There's something very melancholy about a thriving pilgrimage site slowly being forgotten by the rest of the world. But for a brief time, Chavin de Huantar was the beating heart of the Andes, and for that brief moment in the sun, it helped transform Andean culture by allowing new ideas and technologies to diffuse all over. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more ancient American content. And before you go, I have one quick announcement. I've set up a Patreon page for anyone that wishes to financially support the channel. This is important because it'll help pay for research costs. Not sure how many of you may know this, but research material is not always free, and getting good up-to-date sources costs money, and so with your help, we can improve the quality of our videos and explore a wider variety of topics. So please check it out and support us if you are able. Pledge what you can. I'll include the link in the description below. And with that, see you next time.